and welcome back. A couple things to talk about. The uh, we'll talk about eye clickers in a minute. We're going to do some clicking today. We have some eye clicker questions, so no worries about that. Um, as you know, every morning there is a slide that looks like this, and we usually put it together in final form about two weeks in. Now, one of the things that we're eventually going to have in here is the SI schedule. And right now the SI schedule is not quite set. We have something going for Wednesday, but in general the SI schedule will be here, uh, I think, on this slide uh, every day. Uh, and, but right now it's not filled in yet. Um, so uh, I'll also have a quote of the day uh, as soon as I decide what famous uh, historical person I want to have quotes from this semester. And of course, there's always the outline of the day. Now, I want to make an announcement to you, and that is that uh, Miss Darian, our uh, trustee and awesome TA up here in the front, she's going to be tweeting into my... Uh, Twitter stream uh, this morning, uh, class notes. And so that'll be back up to whatever you write down. Also, uh, the, the lectures are each rendered to digital video and then uploaded into YouTube for the morning lecture and the afternoon lecture, and they'll be different. Now, you can look at the afternoon lecture if you like. But, um, and you don't have to look at the morning lecture ever. But if you want to take more simplified notes, listen more and take fewer notes in lecture, and then go back and review the uh, YouTube, uh, that's a highly efficient way of taking notes in class and studying at the same time. So you can save it till you do your homework, then do the lecture notes over or fill them out uh, and flesh them out uh, from skeleton notes to uh, full-fledged lecture notes uh, after you look at YouTube. A couple other things, this and that, that I want to go over. Homework one, uh, and this is a regular physics homework, uh, distances and speeds, which we're going to tackle today. Um, it will go active after this class, and generally, I'm going to try to be a lot more conscientious this semester about getting the homework ready for you so that it's going right after class. I had some students complaining about it uh, on my student evaluations from spring, and I think it's a righteous uh, complaint. So I'm going to try to do it a little bit more efficiently with you, and homework one is ready to go. Uh, there are four exercises in it. It will be due on Thursday at the beginning of lecture. So for this class, that means 10.30 a.m. By the way, you have four attempts in general on every regular homework. Now, homework zero, that's the federal uh, financial surveillance homework thing that I... I'm supposed to have it available until December 3rd. And so no matter how complicated I make it or simple, it's supposed to be open and available till December 3rd, I guess. Uh, and so that's why I made it, it, I activated it with, how many attempts does it admit? 86, 42 attempts. But really all the feds are looking for is clicking. And clicking as of Friday at 11.59. So uh, anyways, your normal homework is not going to have 42 attempts. It's going to have four. Now, every once in a while, uh, there's a blooper in the homework, or we need extra practice on it. So I'll open it up again after class for another one or two attempts so that you can uh, really crush it. Uh, but normally, it's four attempts. Okay, and they're always going to be, according to my procedure, uh, due at the beginning of lecture. 
Also, the, I'm, gonna, I'm also going to try to make the Tuesday assignments a little bit smaller and more compact. Uh, and the Thursday ones will be a little bit longer. They used to be about equal in length on average, uh, but some of the students were complaining about uh, the Tuesday homework being due Thursday, and you don't have as much time, and so I'm going to make them a little bit shorter this year, see how it goes. Okay, iClicker registration uh, is still driving me bonanza. I would like to, I would like the iClicker company to come here and apologize to everybody. But it's not going to happen. So what we're going to do is we're going to endure and prevail. And we're going to experience a little bit of, uh, distress. And so our, our, uh, reaction to that is going to be patience. All right, it's going to get it done. And uh, so I want you to keep trying to register. I talked to a couple students out in the, out in the uh, corridor before class. They said they got it, uh, including uh, who was it that was uh, who came up to me and said, Dr. B, it's working now. With Safari, you were. I told you to sit up here in the front. Now where are you? Oh, way over there. Okay, um, Natasha Dubay. She used Surf Safari on a Mac, and it worked. And she's in. Now the problem is that some of you guys that say that you've registered, I haven't gotten you down onto my roster yet. So I. And I have no, it's, it usually works really well. Um, and, uh, but this semester it's, they, they release a new, a new version every semester. And so it's always a big mess at the, and that's another reason that I, I delay the start of official clicking for your grade until the second, third week of class. So if you don't, if, if you have your clicker, you'll be able to click today. I just won't know who you are until the registration works. So I'm going to keep synchronizing it and hopefully I won't. They were, the, the big shot at the iClicker company was talking, we're one of their biggest accounts, right? UCF, second largest university in the land, all right? So they want to keep our business and so I was talking to one of the big shots yesterday and he was actually telling me well you know you could do this yourself you know and I was like no I want you to do it because you're being paid a lot you guys are making all the money on this I'm not making a dime off of iClicker anyway so we're going to try to get that squared away and um Hopefully by next Tuesday, uh, everything will be copacetic. So you, if you have your clicker, even if you're not registered um, and it didn't work for, for you, you can still click today. And what, what happens is my computer here with this little receiver, the base unit right here, it's, it's like a little cell phone, very primitive, very simple cell phone. You know, it doesn't transmit voice. It just, you know, it transmits clicks, A, B, C, D, and E, and then a bunch of numbers. And so it's very basic, uh, very low, uh, low power. So it only works within about 200 feet of, of here. Uh, but it's a cell phone, and, uh, and it will work. And so my, my computer listens through this antenna. This little antenna job up here, this little thing, it's kind of broken, but it still works. Um, and it, what it does, it picks up the serial number, that little serial number on the back of your rig, okay? And it picks up what you click in. So letter A, B, C, D, or E, or a number, or something like that. Um, and then 
the software synchronizes the roster in web courses so that your NID and your serial number are partnered up and then I know who clicks. So until you register, I'll be getting your clicks, but I won't know it's you. All I'll know is that it's some somebody with a serial number of, you know, 8503CX or something like that, but I won't know it's you. So you got to register and you can't use iClicker.com. You've got these web courses. And so it's a pain in the butt. But we're going to have to do it that way. Otherwise, it's pandemonious. We don't want that. Okay, Twitter feed, Brainwave777X. Uh, Darian's, she is on it. And here's what, you know, here's what it looks like in web browser. Uh, you know, whatever you want to do. Uh, this is a, a tweet that I made yesterday. Uh, yesterday afternoon, the SI session is uh, set up for Wednesday. It's an online session. Um, and just, so just so you know, Darianne and Caroline in the afternoon uh, lecture are going to be tweeting out bytes of lecture notes as I lecture. So you can actually have Twitter open as you take lecture notes. Um, and uh, she, they're, they're also going to do student questions and my answers. Uh, like they did last week. So hopefully it'll be helpful for you. Uh, before we continue, let me pause for questions. Yes. Free $5? Yeah. What about it? I'll, I'm, I'm going to get to that. We haven't got to the... It's a, it's a, it's a physics experiment. Question. Yeah. No. The question was, are there bonus points for early iClicker registration? Uh, are they extended now? No, they're not, but I, I'm going to be pretty generous. I, I have to have the register work, the, the roster synchronizing for that to work. So we're going to get it to work, and I may have to give everybody four points that registers in time for the Tuesday after Labor Day, but... I have no idea, you know, it's never been this bad. Another question. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, I want to talk about Tropical Disturbance 9. I guess this is a tropical storm, not... Uh, Tropical storm, what is it going to be? Tropical storm Henrietta or something? Trop Anyways, whatever it is, it's going to be a tropical storm. It's going to be blazing through here Thursday. So uh, now where I live, I'm up above the water level. Uh, but some of you may need rowboats to get home. Uh, on Thursday, hopefully it will not be too bad. Actually, we're on the southern half of it. It looks like it's going to be heading north of us. Uh, so hopefully it won't be too bodacious. And just so you know, um, if, you, if you ever listen to the Weather Channel or Channel 9, Eyewitness News, uh, or whatever you like to get your, wherever you like to get your, your weather information, they're always talking about the central pressure in millibars. Now we're going to learn about that this semester. And so, and that's why I'm bringing it up as well. You know, we have this thing coming and we're going to learn some of the physics of hurricanes. Another thing, uh, they're big, gigantic convention, convection systems. A thunderstorm is a fairly small convection system uh, in terms of weather. A uh, hurricane is ginormous, hundreds of miles across. Another thing that's important in a hurricane, of course, is the vapor to liquid phase transition. Who knows what happens when vapor changes to liquid in a hurricane? Has anybody ever thought about that? Water vapor turns to liquid? No, not hail. 
it rains. Yeah, I mean, we, yeah, that's the that's that's the process of condensation, and we're going to be learning about that as well. Okay, so just a little preview of coming attractions. Okay, another thing just to go over with you: supplemental instruction schedule, as I mentioned, it's shaping up now. Um, they do have the online section or the online session, I should say, uh, set up. It's in the UCF Adobe Connect, and it's a really good system. Uh, if you've used it before, you'll realize that you can talk, you can have your webcam going, um, and and I use my iPhone earbuds to to do my talking and listening. So you don't really need to have fancy equipment. Um, password is Opal. Maria is going to be running that, um, and it works good. And she'll be talk. And she has a whiteboard, so she'll be able to write stuff on the whiteboard. And I use Adobe Connect as well for my online sections for their office hours uh, every week or so. Now the regular sessions um, in classrooms are not set. Um, uh, so I don't. So it's the schedule is going to look something like this, with the top two levels and the bottom two levels filled in. Right now, all we have is the Wednesday online session. And by the way, the URL for that session um, is in Web Courses, um, and I think I have to publish that uh, anew, um, but it will be uh, available to you. And the password is Opal. It works good. You'll see. Uh, any questions about that? SI. Question. It's like a regular SI session, so it's not going to be new material. You're going to be doing everything that the regular SI, well, almost everything uh, that the regular SI session does. So she'll go over class notes with you and help you with your notes, help you with homework and stuff. And you'll be doing things together, talking and kind of brainstorming and stuff. I, you know, I've never been to an SI session, so I really don't know what they do, but but you'll go, just go and you see it. You know, it, it's going to be helpful and it will help you do better in this class. And it may, I mean, if you want to shoot for being a special study group leader, SI sessions can help you get to that, you know, which is definitely something you want. By the way, I'd like to have a show of hands. Uh, everybody in here now, there's no more dropping or adding. So everybody that's in here is in here. Uh, show of hands. Raise your hand if you're early. Uh, childhood or elementary ed major. Great, 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 great. I love elementary. Okay, secondary uh, ed majors. Great. All right. Now, you may have noticed, you guys may have noticed me saying, are there any questions? And then I wait for 15 seconds. That's called, for those of you that are ed majors, that's called the 15 second rule. The reason I do that, I learned that when I was a grad student in grad school from an old professor, a wily old professor. The 50-second rule, you ed majors, the 50-second rule, you, you just ask for questions and then wait. You zip for 15 seconds. And usually somebody will ask a question. And if they don't, you go on. If they do, you have a question like this uh, fellow over here with the hat that asked me about, the online SI session. Uh, so when when you hear when you see me or hear me pause like that for 15 seconds, it's not like I've got something stuck in my throat or anything like that. I'm doing the 15 second rule. All right, last time we were talking about the grand book of the universe, the grand book of nature, as Professor Galileo mentioned it. You know, the universe is not random. It is readable. It is comprehensible. And so Galileo said it's, it's like a book, a gigantic, a grand book. And that the language in which it was written is mathematical. Now, from that conviction, 
And from having convic- convinced enough of his peers, he was able to found the entire enterprise that we call the physical sciences, the scientific enterprise. Um, and the scientific enterprise, following Galileo's lead, it speaks in that mathematical language. Of course, it also speaks in regular humanoid you know, languages, Italian. That was what Galileo wrote in most of the time. He knew Latin, but he mostly wrote in Italian. English and all the other languages of this big, beautiful world. Um, and so that... If you think about it, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's like I was thinking about this morning. You know, he started this enterprise and he established the standard. He established the standard by looking at nature and being convinced that it has a mathematical structure and that if you are a scientist, you are going to write sentences about nature that have a mathematical backbone or that refer to it at least. You know, because you can't write every equation into every sentence. But he established that as the criterion of truth in the scientific enterprise. Now that's like, if the, the thing that you want to compare science to in this regard is a courtroom. In a courtroom, in a court of law, there are rules and procedures of what is admissible evidence, what is um, probable cause, all that stuff. And so, for instance, there's this, this, um, this rule of evidence. You can look it up, federal rule of evidence, uh, an admission against interest. That's when a, a crook makes an admission that would le- could lead him to be prosecuted for some offense. So... If a, if a criminal defendant makes an admission like that, it's assumed to be true. Now, in Galileo's thing, his, his idea was if you can write a mathematical pattern and measure it in the lab or out in the field somewhere so that somebody else can do it as well, then that's the criterion, it's the signature of truth. Just as the federal law, admission of, against interest, is a signature of truth. We assume that the person that makes that uh, admission is not lying. And so when Galileo started this scientific enterprise, you know what it's like? That means that it's like the first guy that invented laws. Who was it that invented laws? You know, we can't even point to who that was. Or you know what else it's like? Think about this. You're writing a love a love letter, which is this thing on paper that you, you write with, with an ink or a pencil and stuff. For those of you guys that have never written a letter, we used to do that when I was a young man. You know, you write a love letter and stuff, and you write a poem. And, you know, you want your love to be convinced. You Think about Shakespeare, all those sonnets, all those John Donne, all those guys. So for, for Galileo to invent or to develop the scientific enterprise, and he's like the guy, the first guy that invented laws. And he's like the guy that invented poetry. Greater than William Shakespeare. Can you, who was it that made their first poem? Here's another example. Music. Think about music. You know, and music has this effect. It's like another language. You know, it just kind of sinks down into your heart. It can make you cry. It can make you laugh and rejoice. It convicts you. It hits you. And when it hits you, it hits you. So Galileo inventing science, 
is like the, the guy that first invented music. Can you believe that? And nobody knows who that was. Oh my goodness. The guy that invented music? Wow. Anyways, Galileo uh, developed the... And we're all students in his school, as I said last time. Now here's his number one student. The student has become the master, Sir Isaac Newton. Now we're in page three of the textbook. He said in, in the beginning of his masterpiece, his, his most famous book, the, principles of natural, the Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy, uh, although he wrote it in Latin, here's what it says in English. For all the difficulty of philosophy seems to consist in this. What? Philosophy? Yeah, philosophy is the word that they used back in his day for physics. They didn't start using physics as the description of what we do until, you know, 100 years or so after Sir Isaac Newton. So he thought of it as natural philosophy. And I have a, do a doctorate, a PhD, a doctor of philosophy. I, I don't have a doctorate of physics. I have a doctorate of philosophy, natural philosophy. For all the difficult of natural philosophy seems to consist in this. From the phenomena of motions to investigate the forces of nature. And then from these forces to demonstrate the other phenomena. All right, now we're going to take apart this sentence here. It's a pretty important one. Uh, when he says other phenomena, he was thinking... Mm, like comets. Nobody understood what comets were until Sir Isaac Newton developed the theory, all his laws of motion, and the theory of universal gravitation, which we will tackle this semester. And he did it by first starting to talk about the phenomena of motions. So that's what we're going to be studying for the next several lectures, up to lecture 7 and exam 1. And it will take us most of the way through uh, chapter 3 of our textbook and a little bit at the very beginning, chapter 4. All right. Now, that's kind of where we're at right now. And uh, to build on that, I want to now do the free $5 uh, demonstration uh, that I sometimes do at this point of the semester. So what I'm going to do is uh, ask for a volunteer. I'm going to turn the lights up. Question? I'm going to ask for a volunteer to give me $5. And then I'll have... Okay, so you jump... Wait till I say... I want somebody to come up here. And I'm going to drop $5. And I want them to catch it. Well, actually, let me see what I got in my pocket. Uh, oh, wait a minute. I put it up here in my pocket. Uh, I don't think I have $5, so it's only, we're going to have a discount today. It's only going to be $1. <laughs> Usually I do $5. I've seen guys do it with $20 bills. Okay, so I need a, uh, somebody to come up here to the front. Actually, a couple people. Come on up if you want. Uh, anybody else uh, want to? Uh... Okay, with the white hat. Come on up. All right, we'll take two. Now, here's what, here's what we're going to do. This is a regular $1 bill. George Washington's on it. Good. Right now, I want you to verify it. It's like normal. All right, so you've got a normal. It's fairly crispy. You know, it's, it's not too, you know. And now, uh, are you righty or lefty? So I want you to stand over here and put your put your arm kind of like this, and your wrist is extended out past the edge of your table. Okay, I'm gonna stand over here. Okay, and so uh, now what is your name? Erica. Erica is gonna have her arm on the table, and she's gonna go ahead and grab it. Okay, so she's gonna try to grab it when I let it go. Okay, and if she can catch it. Before it falls through her grasp, she can't move her hand down. It's, it's here on the, on the tabletop. If she can catch it, 
she could have. Okay. But see, the thing is, you have to be fast. Okay. And so if you, all right, so the way, the way that we do this, hold your hand like this, okay? And I'm going to put it right here. So it's basically, the bottom of it is basically level with the top of her hand. So it's going to, it's going to look about like this, okay? So she's going to have it about like this. And, and I'm going to try to drop it, and you have a question? Oh! She... You want, should I give her another shot? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so, yeah sorry about that. Best two, best two out of three. Now don't start giggling. Okay, this is serious. <laughs> this is some serious dinero. Okay. Now you can't All right, so I'll, I'll do it with the George Washington facing hour. That might have thrown you off. See, because when you're doing this, um, you're doing this experiment. <laughs> You're doing this experiment. <laughs> I'm starting to laugh. Erica, don't make me laugh. This is, this is serious scientific activity. So the, this this uh, this dollar bill, if, if she can catch it, then <laughs> okay. Uh, give Erica a hand. Thank you, Erica. You're great. Okay, now what's your name? Carlos. Carlos. Uh, right or lefty? Lefty? I can do right. No, no. Stay over here. Okay, now, Carlos, you guys over there won't be able to see it. You saw the, did you see it with Erica? Okay. So we're going to do it on this side because uh, Carlos is left. He's up here. Yeah. I want that dollar. Dollar menu, guys. Dollar menu nuggets. Chicken nuggets. Okay, go ahead and try it. Where's that? Okay, so it feels normal. Okay. <laughs> See, because Carlos is it? <laughs> but we got best two out of three. Best two out of three. Best two out of three. Because Carlos, and I'm gonna tip, I'm gonna tip it upside down, just so that maybe this will, you know, kind of reverse the gravitational pull of the Earth, almost. And so, see. Okay, good. That was just a test. I have to. I have to be able to do it. And, oh! Yeah. Follow your hand. You gotta watch your hand. Oh. Ooh, Carlos just gotta revealed. Stop listening to you. See, watch that's right. Watch the hand. All right. So. <laughs> you know, I did a few steps, and, and in fact, it's on YouTube. Uh, I did a few semesters with a, a, a bill with a five dollar bill, and he caught it just like Carlos. And I needed that money for my lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, was, I was really what a disaster. Anyways, I, so I still have two dollars for bus fare, so that's all right. Um, so that's the free five dollars. Now what we're going to do is try to tackle that, and let me just. Um, point out to you that um, I have a digital video of that in YouTube's in our YouTube area. Uh, just go to the, to the YouTube area and look in the demonstrations playlist and you'll find it. And it's the famous incident of me <laughs> losing the five dollars. You know Carlos, you're the second. Have you ever seen anybody get it? It's our third one. Man, I'm losing my... He said, don't listen to his voice. Watch his hand. And see, that's the whole thing. You know? So when, I, when, when the student up here in the front with the orange shirt, he, he kind of distracted me a little. I allowed myself to be distracted. And that distracted Erica. And then the dollar bill went down. And so the whole thing is... It's going to drop, so go ahead and make some notes here. Um, the dollar bill is going to drop a certain distance between when you see it drop and when you get your hands around it. 
So, if, so in other words, human reaction time. So the question is, does it drop through your hand? It, are your reactions fast enough that it will not completely drop below your hand before you can close your hand and get it? And Carlos was, I must have telegraphed it. I'm going to have to work on my technique. I've been losing too much money on this demonstration. But anyways, so that whole idea of free fall, distance, we're going to try to tackle that today. And we're going to do it on the document camera in just a few minutes. But before we do that, I want to go through some of the basic stuff about motions in two dimensions uh, plus time. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with some simple stuff and then we're going to tackle the uh, free $5 demonstration uh, after we do some of the basic stuff. All right. And hopefully I won't lose. Man, I'm going to have to be ultra, ultra sharp for the noon section because if I lose another dollar bill, I won't have bus fare to get home. I'll be stranded at UCF. Um, okay, so let's talk about it. Uh, go ahead and make a sketch on your notebook. We're going to need some room, so go to a fresh page of your notebook if, if necessary. Um, let's just say that you have point A and point B, kind of like what I've got up here, point A over here on the left side, towards the middle, point B on the right side, a little bit higher up. And say that you're studying the motion of an object that moves uh, between point A and point B. And this seems like it's really cinchy and almost kindergartenish, but no matter how fancy the physics are, even, for instance, in quantum field theory, this is kind of the thing that we have to build up quantum field theory, which is like the most difficult theory of all, uh, we have to start basically at the same point and ask these same questions. All right, first of all, uh, you got to map it out. So, for instance, on graph paper, can you see that graph paper? Can you guys from the back see that? Okay, um, got to graph in the x and y axes. So, graph in, and I got my axes uh, down here in the lower, connecting down here in the lower left. Uh, my x and my y. Y is the vertical axis. That's indicated up here at the top of the vertical axis. And then the x is indicated over here at the right end of the horizontal axis. And I haven't moved point A and point B, but they're, they're still the same location. But now I have a coordinate system. Okay? And now I have to decide... Um, what my coordinate system is going to measure. In other words, does it measure meters? Each line of graph paper, each block of graph paper, does it stand for meters or miles or nanometers or what? And, the, and that's an, a normal query because um, it's like asking, well, are you measuring humans for which a meter is a pretty good measurement? Uh, or are you measuring cities for which a mile or a kilometer is a good measurement? Or are you measuring atoms for which a nanometer? A nanometer is a good measurement for an atom, and a nanometer is about, or is, defined as one billionth of a meter. And you can read about uh, nanometers in chapter one. There's a little blurb on scientific notation that you also want to go over uh, in chapter one. So let's, let's do meters. All right. So this is like this classroom. Okay. Uh, this classroom is pretty big, right? and let's count out the squares. Now, point B uh, is 44, 24, and that's exact on my graph paper. If you make yours look about the right proportions, you know, that'll be good. You might not have graph paper for your notebook, but if you write it about these proportions, it should be good. Now, point A... 8 comma 16. Now I'm not writing in meters, but I could if I wanted to. 8 meters comma 16 meters. 
uh, and for point B, 44 meters, comma, 24 meters. Um, and so uh, I don't think this room is 44 meters across, but it's maybe 25 meters across. So it's a little bit bigger. So this would be like uh, out in the parking lot maybe. All right, so that's, that's a human scale. All right. So here's the, here's the dotted line. Draw a straight line between those two points. And the very first thing that you've got to do from those two positions, point A and point B, first thing you want to do, if you're trying to figure out the motion, is um, figure out what's the distance between those two. All right. So for that, you have to look at a right triangle. And if you've got your graph paper hooked up right, it's fairly basic to do a right triangle either like this or maybe one slanting the other way. But you know, usually you can do a, a right triangle of some kind. Now let me park it down here a little bit. Um, and this one happens to be uh, 36 meters by 8 meters. Okay, 36 meters across. And that's the difference between 44 and uh, 8. 44 minus 8 is 36. And it's meters. Uh, similarly, 24 minus 16 is the difference in the y coordinates. Uh, that's 8 meters. All right. Now, uh, I'll just invite you to read more about uh, triangles and other shapes in the appendix of the textbook. By the way, who's gotten the textbook yet? Raise your hand if you've got it. Okay, that's a good fraction of you. When you get it, you can um, dig in and look at a, a few more uh, examples of right triangles. And this is about as much trig as we're going to do in this class, basically a little bit of right triangle action. Uh, but cool, Question? Uh, well, one ended up being on back order, so that's cool, right? Yeah, what I'm doing in lecture should hold you. The textbook, when you get it, will uh, help you flesh out and, and learn even more than what I talk about in lecture, okay? So, yeah, so get the, get the textbook as soon as you can. Uh, anybody get it from the textbook publisher? Raise your hand if you did. Okay, that's a, that's, whoa. Raise your hand if you got it from the bookstore. That is, that is unbelievable. They don't have any? They are such, I can't believe them. This is, oh, I wish, I'm not going to state my wishes concerning the bookstore, <laughs> but other than to say that uh, they drive me bonanza. All right, so here's the distance calculation. Um, and as I said, if you look in the appendix, you'll see how the, Pythagorean theorem works. Right triangle, 36 squared plus 8 squared. Add them up, you get 1360. Then take the square root of that, and you get 36.9. Okay, so go ahead and jot that down. And whatever you have um, a pair of locations in space, you can always figure out the right triangle like this. Uh, and... Uh, even in three dimensions. Now we're just working on two-dimensional graph paper, but in, in three dimensions you use Pythagorean theorem again. It's, it's not that bodacious. Now I want to try a distance calculation with you on the eye clicker. And so get your clicker open and uh, what we're going to do is um, a, a multiple choice, and this is not a Chuck Norris, it's a regular question. Uh, it's pretty cinchy, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be about a hypotenuse. Uh, and if you have not used your clicker in this class yet before, what you want to do is hold the power button down until the big square flashes in the upper left of the display, and then type in A and A again, and then you'll get a check mark, and it'll say go nitro, and then it'll say ready. So here's the question. All right, and here's the... Here again is the instructions. Uh, type in AA and, and you'll, you'll be good. Um, 
So go ahead and vote for this. And we'll talk about the correct answer for this in just a minute. Calculate the distance between point Q and point C. Hey, wait a minute. Is, is the distance from C to Q different than the distance from Q to C the other way? No, it's the same line. It's, it's, it's reversible, so everything's good. But can you get it? And I'll give you a minute. Now, if you're working with a neighbor that you're friends with, uh, go ahead and see what they got and, or coach them. Uh, and in general, it's always good to have a, a study partner. So if, you don't, if you've looked around in this class and you don't see anybody that you're friends with, uh, then make a friend. If you want to be a friend, if you want to have a friend, be a friend. Let's see, I've got 83 answers in here, 89. Let me show you this. So here's the little scoreboard. We've been doing it for a minute and 22 seconds. And now we've got 112 students answer. Okay, 10 seconds to vote. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Okay, we've got 173 people voting. And here, you're just, you know, even if you get it wrong, it's, it's not going to hurt you because it's not an official clicking session, but it will help you uh, to think, and that's what we want. Okay, 178 students answered. And, uh, yeah, pretty nice. Uh, most of you answered E. E is the correct answer. And students, I'm always going to, give you the correct answer. Uh, actually, almost all the time I'll give you a correct answer. Uh, in this case, it's E. Now, here's how to calculate it. If you got it wrong, let's just go over the procedure. Here we go. There's your Pythagorean theorem. The hypotenuse squared is equal to 62 squared plus 92 squared. Okay, so you square root those two babies. Well, first you add them. First you calculate them out. And you add them together. And then you uh, square root the sum. And that works out to 111 approximately. All right. And so that's... And we're going to be doing this from time to time. Not a whole lot, but it's, it's you know, nice little mini workout here. Now, I want to um, give you a question answering strategy now in case you were totally um, bulldozed by that question, which, you know, there's a wide range of students in here. Uh, in terms of their math experience. So you might have been bulldozed by it. Here's, here's a way to, um, to figure it out. By the way, that's the distance in meters. I measured it out in Google Maps this morning. Uh, from Cadoba in the Student Union to Chick-fil-A over next to the bookstore. So you can tell I'm thinking about lunch. Anyway, so test-taking strategy. You might want to make a note of this. And what we're going to do is try to find a reason in case you don't know how to calculate it, is it possible to reject some of the answers? You know how they always say, see if you can cross out some of the answers and then make an educated guess. All right. So we're going to try to figure out uh, how to do that. Question? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do this. So what we're going to do. All right, let's look at the first option, 154. What's wrong with that? Well, first of all, it's too big. And what number is it? That's just the sum of the two perpendicular sides. 92 plus 62. That's no good. Not for the hypotenuse. Okay, so, so it, it can't be that big. Whatever it is, it can't be that big. And by the same token, so we'll cross that one out. By the same token, 30, that's too small. What is 30? Where does 30 come from? 
Yeah, subtraction. It's the difference between 32 and 6 and, and 90. Excuse me. It's the difference between 62 and 92. All right. So that's too small. All right. Conclusion. That option B is out. And the conclusion is the hypotenuse has got to be somewhere below 154. And it's going to be bigger than 62. It's going to be bigger than 30. And in fact, it's going to be bigger than uh, 62. And, and actually, it has to be bigger than 92. So you can, you can actually narrow it down a little bit more. Do you see how you can, if you know this much, do you see how you can nail the correct answer now? If this is all you know, you can get the answer right. Even if you don't have a square, even if you don't have a calculator, you can nab it. And my wonderful students, on exams, you might want to make this down. Write this down. I do not like trick questions. You know, so if I was a real, you know, one of these kind of uh, instructors that, you know, gives you, well, what's the hypotenuse? Is it 110.4, 110.6, or 110.9? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to give you a question that if you can remember a couple things, you have a good shot at getting the right answer, all right? And you know what that makes you do? That makes you think. And that's what I always say. On my exams, you've got to think, all right? And if you can think, and if you can get one or two more uh, points on the exam, that's great. At the end of the semester, that's going to add up, you know, if you can think. Now, if this is true, the hypotenuse has got to be between 62 and 54. Ching. Ching. Those other two are out. So the only one left, cha-ching. Number 111, or, or option E, 111. All right. So remember that. And, and this applies, you know, you're not going to have hypotenuse calculations on the midterms or anything like that. But you are going to have to think. You're, I probably catch one. Or, I'll probably catch everybody on one or two questions that you're going to have to. Whoa! Let me think this one out. And hopefully, if you think it out carefully, you'll be able to nab the right answer, just the way that I did on this one. All right. Now let's get back to uh, point A and point B. Now this line segment we drew. That's a nice line segment. That gives us the distance on a map. Um, and if, if you're a crow, if you're the proverbial crow, that's the distance that a crow flies. All right? But that might not be the actual motion of the object. If your object is not the proverbial crow, you might have some different path. For instance, between point A and point B, you might have a curved path. And we're going to be able to tackle that. In a curved path, you're going in a whole slew of different directions. You're on the steering wheel. You've got to use the steering wheel. Whereas the crow, the straight line segment that the crow flies, the crow doesn't have to hit the steering wheel. He can just keep it set nice and steady. Right? But this red fuzzy path, a uh, student here who is... Uh, visually impaired for colors, uh, if, if you're in this section, please see me after class. I want to make sure this stuff is visible for you. Um, anyways, curved path, the fuzzy path. Yeah, We're, we'll be able to ha handle that. Uh, so let me park that down here to the bottom. Uh, but that's not the only path. How about this one, a segmented path? In a couple, couple three straight line segments, that's point A to point B. But it's not a straight line motion. You know, you get three different directions. Whereas this one down here, you have a continuous array of directions. And up here on the dashed line, you have one constant direction, straight line motion. Um, and so we're going to try to talk about all of these distinctions. Another thing that we don't have yet is the temporal information. In other words, 
What was the clock reading when it was at point A? Well, we don't have that. All right, so let's... So let's just say 1.22.08 p.m. at point A. And 1.22.47 p.m. at point B. All right. And so what's the elapsed time? Okay, the student in, 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 the, in the middle here said it's the elapsed time is the student is the time from the second time minus the first time. And that is correct. What's the number? 39, 39 seconds. Okay, that's an elapsed time. You know, and if you're going 36.9 uh, meters, that's, you know, that's a normal speed. It's kind of pokey, but it's not too bad. Now, here's another question I want you to jot down. Whichever path it takes... Does its speed vary? We know its direction might vary, but does the speed vary as well? In other words, if you're on this uh, red uh, fuzzy path here that's curved continuously, is your speed also, is your speedometer changing as you go through the curves? If you're in a car, it might. Now, those are pretty graceful curves, but, you know, you might... You know, you might be kind of nervous, you know, and you might ease up on the gas, hit the brake a little bit, and that'll change your speedometer rating. Same thing with the segmented path. You might have different speeds there, too, you know. So um, whichever path you're on, um, how the speed varies between point A and point B between time TA and time TB um, is important for us. So um, let's make a list of the things that we need. Okay. On the graph paper, we graph up the positions, calculate a distance. And for most of the time in this class, we're going to be working in meters. But eventually, we'll be doing nanometers. And occasionally we'll do a little bit of kilometer action. Uh, seconds is main, are mainly, you know, a second is a, is a fraction of a day. Uh, a meter st started out its life as a fraction of the circumference of the earth. Um, I think it's uh, one ten millionth of the distance from the equator to the North Pole on the uh, line of uh, longitude that passes through Paris, France. Uh, and you can read about that in chapter uh, one as well. Uh, directions. Uh, directions are how to, you know, and we're not going to have to do ultra, ultra precise directions. So, for instance, this, uh, the point A to point B, the straight line path, you could call that roughly northeast if it goes from point A to point B. If it goes from point B to point A, then you would say roughly southwest. It's going the opposite direction. But for us, it's going roughly northeast. And then you want to get the speed for each time. And so um, uh, that's the kind of stuff that we're going to need. Now, we're going to put all this together in a very basic uh, calculation now. Uh, but before we pause, uh, before we continue... Uh, let me see a show of hands, uh, those of you that are, that have had a calculus class either here or in high school. Raise your hand if you, okay, now everybody, look at that, that's a fair sprinkling of people that have had calculus class, but we're not allowed to use calculus in this class, uh, not legally anyways, um, but you guys that are in calculus, you're going to see it everywhere. Okay, and here's the first place. You're going to see a derivative. Okay, so to get a speed, here's the formula for speed. The change in the x-coordinate divided by the change in the time. Now, the symbol delta x refers to the difference in the two x-coordinates. So, 
That's like uh, 44 minus 8 for the uh, graph paper example. Uh, or possibly um, in the numerator, you might have uh, a hypotenuse like what we did, 36.9, for the uh, straight line path. You know, we could have that as well. So you just have to look at what you got. In free fall, it might be delta y for downward along the y-axis, in the, in the direction of the y-axis. And usually we're going to measure that in meters. Okay, so now we're going to do an example of this in just a minute. Uh, elapsed time between the two events. Again, this is the difference in the two clock settings, or excuse me, the two clock readings. And so for us, on that last example, that was 39 <coughs> seconds. And the speed V, V is the usual symbol for speed. And go ahead and make a, a, a note over the side of the word velocity. Velocity also uses the symbol V, but with a little extra decoration. Hold on a second, I gotta sneeze. Right. I guess I don't have to sneeze. All right, so there's our elapsed time. Um, so when I say the word elapsed time, I'm basically taking the later time minus the earlier time. So T subscript B minus T subscript A. And delta X, by the same token, is X subscript B minus X subscript A. The further point, or the earlier, the, the later point minus the earlier point. All right, now speed is the quotient, as this formula indicates. And the concept that you would attach to it is that the speed is the average time rate of change of position for whatever it is that you're tracking, All right? And we call it a time rate of change because we're taking the change in position, delta x, how many meters does it change per second? We could, if we were measuring the motion of continents uh, in the, Continental drift theory, we would, we would maybe measure centimeters per century. But for us, it's going to be meters per second most of the time. So let's get to the nitty-gritty here. Here's our formula. Okay. And let's put in, uh, for our example, 36.9 meters on top, 39 seconds on the bottom. And that's pretty good. And then if you have your calculator, start bringing your calculator to class because we'll, we'll probably have one or two calculations that you can verify. Now, who verifies me on this? What do you get? What do you get? Who's got it? What do you Anybody else verify that, 0 0.946? Yeah. Okay, good. That's what I got. All right, so, and your unit of measurement here is meters per second. Uh, now, I want to give you a little uh, background tip, kind of a side note. One meter per second is approximately two and a quarter miles per hour. Let me repeat that. One meter per second is about two and a quarter miles per hour. So this speed here is about two point something miles per hour. It's kind of pokey. You can walk faster than, than that easily. If you're feeling a bit pokey, that's the speed you walk. If you're being chased by grizzly bear, you know, you're going to be going a little bit faster than that, hopefully. Now, another factor concerning speed. The distance formula is derived from that. It's based on this average speed formula. And it's basically this, the distance traveled delta x is equal to v times delta t. Basically, all you're doing is multiplying both sides by delta t, 
And on, the, on one side, you're left with delta x. And on the other side, v times delta t. Speed times time. And this is a, an important concept that I want to go over with you. Um, and, and we're going to do this on the document cam in just a minute. Uh, and Darian, if you can come up and help me with this stuff in just a minute. Um, if you know the average speed and the amount of time that you've taken, you can figure out the distance traveled. And we're going to leverage that to figure out um, what happens in free fall. And hopefully we'll be able to do it in the next 10 minutes. All right. And uh, so what we're going to do now is we're going to uh, talk about the free fall. Uh, actually, we're going to start. We're going to talk about just regular straight line motion at constant speed. And then we're going to talk about free fall. And I'm going to turn. I'm going to draw it on the document cam up here. I'm going to turn the lights up and draw it on the document cam. And then you're going to, and, and I'm going to re record it with my smart pen. And you'll be able to re-listen to it in a talking PDF. So I'll probably do that tonight. All right. And just as a reminder, homework one is going to go active at the end of lecture today. So you will have homework due on Thursday morning. Now let me 